Let's talk about how we can use the moon for a greater purpose in the decades and centuries to come. Obviously, it's a very cool and exciting place to go walk around on or drive robots or do science. Those things are a given. And it's amazing that we are finally getting back to working on these kinds of projects after taking an inexplicable 50-year hiatus from exploring the moon. But what if we think bigger and further into the future? We essentially have a second planet at our disposal here, and we're fortunate that ours is a relatively gigantic one as far as planetary satellites go. Earth's moon is the fifth largest of its kind in the entire solar system. Our moon is actually a fair bit larger than Pluto, which is only two-thirds the diameter. We know that there is an abundance of useful elements on the moon, like iron, aluminum, silicon, manganese, and titanium. There is plenty of oxygen and water available as well. Plus, the moon offers up an environment that is fundamentally different from what we experience here on Earth. The combination of low gravity and virtually non-existent atmosphere on the moon presents some challenges, obviously, but we can't ignore the fact that it creates just as many opportunities. New possibilities that simply couldn't happen on the Earth. All right, here's what I'm getting at. We should build spaceships on the moon. Lots of them. We should leverage the moon and its unique characteristics to create humanity's first interstellar spaceport and use that as a gateway to finally gain access to our solar system and the wonders that it has to offer. This is the Space Race. Okay, let's start off with a talk about why the moon is our best running candidate for humanity's very first spaceport. It might not be 100% perfect, but the moon offers up a very favorable set of conditions for building and launching spaceships. In situ resources available on the moon are going to be a major factor in the success of a spaceport. Because if we have to ship too many materials up from the Earth, then that's going to pretty much eliminate most of the moon's advantages. So we have to make use of what the moon offers. And fortunately for us, it has a lot to provide. Among the most useful elements available in lunar regolith or moon dirt is silicon. We all know this one as a prized semiconductor, easily one of the most useful elements to our modern society. We need silicon to make computers and electronic devices. It is a key ingredient in the production of solar panels, and we combine silicon with metals like aluminum and iron to make alloys that are used in manufacturing things like electrical generators and machine tools. Silicon is very abundant on Earth, and luckily, the same is true for the moon. About 20% of that lunar regolith will be made up of silicon. Then there are useful metals available on the surface of the moon like titanium and aluminum. We're pretty confident that titanium is actually abundant in the mar basalt regions of the moon. These are the dark areas that we can see with the naked eye. Up to 8% of the regolith in these darkened regions could be titanium. Areas rich in titanium will also contain iron and oxygen, which is a great bonus. Aluminum is most likely to be found in the lunar highlands, which would be the whiter, brighter parts when we look at the moon. Something between 10 and as much as 20% of the regolith in these areas could be aluminum just waiting to be turned into a spaceship hull. Then we have rare earth metals. These are some lesser known metals like scandium, europium, thulium, and a bunch of other fun names that we're not going to try and pronounce. We need these elements to make important things like magnets, lasers, battery electrodes, capacitors, telescope lenses, fiber optic cables, and computer hard drives. We don't know for sure that these are present on the moon in any significant quantity, but most people who know about these kinds of things seem to agree that there is a strong possibility for it. And there are even some useful elements on the moon that are actually pretty much non-existent on Earth. Helium-3 is a great example. This is created by solar wind bombarding the surface of the moon and radiating the dust. So 
it's good that doesn't happen here, and it's great that we have such easy access to this element on the moon, because the cosmic radiation left behind in the helium-3 can likely be used to fuel a nuclear reaction, which would allow us to generate large quantities of electricity on the moon. This is particularly important because of the prolonged day-to-night cycle up there. While two weeks of constant sunlight is amazing for solar power, the two weeks of perpetual darkness that follows would make solar nearly useless as a sustainable energy source. The volume of batteries we would need to store 14 days worth of energy is just way too much. Three products I use every day are deodorant, toothbrush, and cologne. I like to stay clean and smell good, which is why I am excited to share our new sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a new way to discover, shop, and purchase cologne and perfume. For just $17 per month, you get to pick a new designer perfume or cologne each month, along with lots of unisex options. You'll get a 30-day supply so you can test them out and see which ones you like best before committing to a larger, more expensive bottle. This month, I received three very different cologne options. Vetheiser by Malin and Goetz, Fierce by Abercrombie and Fitch, and Well Played by Confessions of a Rebel. The Malin and Goetz is the most kind of manly smell, while the others have a bit more unisex, which I prefer. I like the smell of grapefruit and lavender, and so does my girlfriend, so let's be honest, I'm gonna go with those ones. And if you're unsure of what fragrance you or someone you know would like, you can take a simple quiz on Scentbird based on your preferences, previous purchases, and quiz answers they'll help you find the fragrance you love. Make sure to use my coupon code TSR55 for 55% off at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. Available in the US and Canada. So thank you Scentbird for the sponsorship. Check out the links below for more information and let's get back to the video. So if the moon has basically all of the stuff that we already have here on Earth, then why don't we just keep building spaceships down here where we already have the infrastructure set up? Well, Earth is a bit of a catch-22. While it does present the most favorable conditions for life as we know it to survive and thrive, the Earth is also one of the worst places in the solar system to try and launch a rocket into space. There are two major factors that plague rocket designers. The Earth's thick atmosphere and its force of gravity. So, any rocket we design has to be powerful enough to cut through that atmospheric resistance while also overpowering the gravitational well that is pulling it back down towards the ground. And the heavier the rocket, the more power it requires to do that. This is why the booster stage on the gigantic SpaceX Starship rocket uses 33 engines, and we still don't even know for sure if that's enough power to get the fully loaded second stage into orbit. It has yet to be tested. And the second problem comes in if you want to get any part of your spaceship back down to the Earth in one piece, because the atmospheric resistance that makes it so hard to go up also makes it problematic to come back down. So the reason that space capsules or shuttles erupt into giant fireballs when they re-enter the atmosphere is all about friction caused by the extreme speed that these objects are moving at in orbit. There's this optical illusion that happens when we look at a video from space, like when astronauts at the ISS are doing their spacewalks. Everything looks like it's just calmly floating around up there, like we imagine that things in orbit just kind of float, when in reality they are moving at an unfathomably high rate of speed. The International Space Station is currently traveling at 28,000 kilometers per hour, or 7.66 kilometers per second. So when a crew capsule lets go of the ISS and starts making its way back home, this is the kind of velocity that it will hit the atmosphere with. That force will violently compress the air molecules that the capsule moves through, and that compression will drastically raise the heat of those gases until the surface of the capsule reaches as high as 1500 degrees Celsius. So. All of that to say that even if we did build a gigantic interstellar transport ship here on Earth, we would never be able to actually get it up into space. And that is where the moon comes back into play. The moon has an extremely reduced force of gravity compared to the Earth. 
Obviously, we've all seen astronauts hopping around on the moon, even with their big clunky spacesuits, and they were able to do that because the gravity up there is only about one quarter the strength that it is down here. And there's basically zero atmosphere present on the moon. I mean, there is some, but it's negligible. So it will be significantly easier to launch and land spaceships on the moon than it could ever possibly be on the Earth. For a measurement of that difference, we can look at something called escape velocity. This is the minimum speed that an object must reach to escape the gravitational influence of a celestial body. The escape velocity of the Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second, and this calculation cannot factor in atmospheric resistance. So the real number is more complicated, but for comparison's sake, the escape velocity of the moon is just 2.4 kilometers per second. Now, that's still very fast. It's faster than a bullet, but still pretty easy in the grand scale of things compared to the Earth. Now, that's not to say the moon is our only possibility for a spaceport candidate. There are a couple of other options to consider just for the sake of argument, like an orbital space station, for example. Why not just build spaceships in space? We definitely could build some kind of an orbital spaceport that either hangs out around the Earth or the moon or maybe even uses a Lagrange point to just anchor it at some point in between. But that really feels like a cart before the horse situation. It seems unlikely that we could actually build a giant space station without already having significant infrastructure and manufacturing on the moon anyway, because we know that moving large quantities of stuff into space from the Earth is super difficult. So it seems more reasonable to fully develop operations on the moon first and then try for large scale infrastructure in orbit. And then there's also gravity coming in with a big factor. The moon has very low gravity, but in orbit there is zero gravity. And that's just going to really complicate us trying to work and live and build spaceships and stuff. On the moon, you can stand firmly on the ground. You can put down a tool on a table without it floating away. You can drink water without it turning into an orb. And while even low gravity is still going to be very detrimental to the human body, you'll still get issues with muscle and bone loss, reduced immune function, and all that. Zero G would be significantly worse, unless we implement simulated gravity on a space station. But if we discount some magical technology like what they have in a science fiction show, the only way to do that is to make a giant space station that constantly rotates, which is very likely possible, but it just throws another giant complication into the mix of an already preposterously difficult plan. And then there's Mars. Mars is arguably a much more appealing spaceport location just due to the fact that it is so much more exciting than the moon. Mars is distant and unknown. It's a dangerous and alien world. It's red. Mars has a lot going for it. And there are all of the resource advantages, if not even more in situ resource possibilities than what the moon offers. Plus, the Martian gravity is a little bit closer to Earth's while still being low enough for easy spaceship launches. Mars is much closer to the wealth of resources contained in the asteroid belt, and it is one step closer to the outer solar system, bringing us closer to the spectacular wonders of Jupiter and Saturn and all of the moons that they play host to. These moons are also our best shot at finding alien life or even potential future outposts for a multi-planetary human race. Mars is really cool, but Mars is also complicated. It is closer to the great beyond, but also much farther away from our home base on the Earth. It takes months to fly to Mars and only a few days to reach the moon. So the moon is the safe bet, or as safe as anything gets when it comes to exploring outer space. And that alone makes it easily the top choice. This is obviously not anything that happens soon. You and I will be probably long dead before this kind of thing really gets going, but it's still fun to think about, and maybe we'll get lucky enough to be around to watch the foundations being laid on the moon for a future spaceport to come. That'd be pretty cool. But let us know how you see a moon base and eventually moon spaceport evolving over time. What will something like that even look like? Drop your theories in the comment section below.
Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.